thank you all so much. It is fantastic to be here today. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the organizers who put this event on, uh, those who invited me to speak. I am so glad to be a part of this event. Now, if you would have told me 20 years ago that I would be speaking at Pride, I would have not believed you whatsoever. It has been a long journey for me getting here today as somebody who grew up in the churches of the Bible Belt. Um, but I cannot be more pleased to be here today with all of you. I remember when I was younger being taught that being gay was sinful. That those who are gay or those who adopt a homosexual lifestyle are condemned by God. At first and for quite some time, I simply accepted the church's teachings as they were, without really thinking all that much about it. But over time, as I met more and more people who were gay, I started to sense a disconnect. Something wasn't right. Something wasn't making sense. And this feeling grew and grew over time. Now, I don't know about some of you who also grew up in the churches of the Bible Belt, but I vividly remember prayer meetings where people would literally lay hands on those struggling with what was called the demon of homosexuality. And they'd try to pray the gay away. I remember a couple of friends who tried so hard to be straight. They did everything their church told them they were supposed to do. They would go to therapy. They would pray. They would try so hard. Yet time and time again, all this only made them feel worse about themselves. That despite all of their best efforts, they felt like they would never measure up in the eyes of God. It was like the system yeah. was set up against them. And I remember feeling very frustrated at God. God seemed incredibly it so we can unfair. Tell him how evil, devilishly wrong he is. What kind of value such a God has? At one point along the way, I thought about homosexuality as a sin along the same lines of alcoholism or adultery. And we still hear that, don't we, all too often in Christian circles? But after a while, even that no longer added up in my mind. I mean, think about it. If someone is an alcoholic and they get sober, their life gets better. Their life improves. And if in a relationship... Neither put your cheeks on the other. Well, obviously that is much healthier for the relationship. The relationship is better. But I started to notice that people who are gay do not tend to get better over time when they try to renounce their sexuality. In fact, the gay people I knew who were most healthy were actually the ones who had come to terms with their sexuality and did not try to repress or ask God to change it, but had accepted it as part of who God created them to be. Sir, look at the sign. Right here. And I started to think that people You're don't accountable, choose son. to be gay any more than I ever chose. Pastor, to be supposedly, good. Brentwood Christian Church. Now at this point along the way I really wasn't sure what to do. All I knew was that I was in the process of changing my mind. And I didn't know what would come next. There's this great scene out of Mark Twain's novel Adventures of Huckleberry Finn that actually ended up being quite formative for me in its own way. This scene features Huck going back and forth wondering what to do about his friend Jim a slave who Huck had helped escape. Now Huck knew he was supposed to return Jim to his owner. He knew he could get in big trouble for helping a slave get away. After all, Huck knew what he 
had been taught. Huck had been taught that everyone has their place. And for slaves, that place was with their master. In helping free Jim, Huck also knew he was going against what he had been taught. What he had been taught by social convention, and yes, what he had been taught by the church. In Huck's words, quote, the plain hand of providence was slapping me in the face, letting me know my wickedness was being watched from up there in heaven. Huck recalled the way that in Sunday school class, he learned that people who helped free the slaves, the way that he is helping free Jim, they go to everlasting fire. So out of fear, in order to do what Huck says was the right thing, and the clean thing, according to my church, Huck decided to write a letter to Jim's owner telling her where she could pick Jim up. Huck said that after writing the letter, he felt all good and all washed clean of sin for the first time. And I know I could pray now. I was thinking how good it was that this happened so, and how near I came to being lost and going to hell. But then I went on thinking. I went on thinking. And I got to thinking about our trip down the river, Jim and me. And I see my friend Jim before me all the time. And somehow I couldn't seem to strike no places. The heart of me against him, even though I know what I was taught. Huck thought about his friendship with Jim. And he thought about the letter that he was supposed to send to Jim's owner. Telling her where she could pick up Jim. And he went back and forth. Back and forth, wondering what to do. Then finally, Huck took the letter. He held it in his hand. And he says, I was a trembling. Because I got to decide forever betwixt two things, and I know that I studied a minute, sort of holding my breath, and then says to myself, well, all right then, all right then, I will go to hell. And I tore up that letter because I could not betray my friend. For Huck, there is a deeper ethic, a deeper truth at work than what he was initially taught by social convention and by the church. It was a truth that valued the dignity of all people, including slaves. And Huck began to realize that what he had been taught by his church, what he had been taught by social convention was flat out. Wrong. And of course, I started thinking about all of this in relationship to my friends who are gay. When I began to consider the possibility that the church got it wrong when it came to slavery and women's rights, or that the Bible often reflects the prejudices, prejudices of the day and the culture in which it was written. When I began to recognize these kinds of things, it was like I was able to see with new eyes. Hmm. I started to believe that the, the church voice of the got devil. wrong historically when it comes to my LGBT friends. Nowadays, Nowadays, I'm at the point where I do not advocate for the rights of all people in spite of my faith, but rather precisely because of my faith. I recognize that from a historical perspective, the teachings of the church have often been problematic, have often fallen short got the of faith the of measure demons. of love. One scripture. And yeah. any time the teachings of the church or of social yeah. convention, yeah. any time they fall short of the measure of love, 
then the church, then society, then all of us are called to reconform and reconfigure so that our world, our society, better reflects the measure of love. For if love is the only measure, St. Augustine once said, then the only measure of love is love without measure. Nowadays, it is by faith in Christ, the one who embodied such beautiful love, that leads me to stand up for the rights of all, the dignity of all. It is by faith in Christ that leads me to be more inclusive of others rather than less. If Jesus is Lord, as Christians often say He is, He shows us that life is measured by love. That is the principle that I will hold dear. That is the principle that we stand and celebrate here today, whether we are religious or not. And of course, we remember that that ethic of love transcends religions. It is found in a wide number of religions, and it is not only found within religion. Now in closing, I just want to reflect very briefly. Um, a lot of people, especially after the YouTube video, have said that I've got a lot of courage as a pastor to come out and support the gay community. That I risk my job and things along those lines. And I appreciate such sentiments. I very much appreciate such sentiments. But I always also want to respond by saying a couple of things. First, is that there are a whole lot of pastors like myself, many of them here today, who they may not be the most vocal uh, voices in our uh, community or in our society, but there are many of us here uh, who are open, who are affirming. And so I'm hardly alone. Um, also, I always want to say a big thanks to the community of Brentwood Christian Church and the people there who I have the privilege of working with. It is because of their support. It is because of their support and their encouragement that I am able to vocalize my support in a public way. What's this, what's this guy's name? Bill Schneider. Pastor That's right. Bill Schneider. But more importantly... Brentwood Community Church. And this is what I, I try to emphasize... He leads most. men down the broad road to destruction and hell. That's that any kind Run of adversity from that him. I face as a straight white male ally is nothing... Would you agree, Pastor Mark? The daily adversity Would you agree? By my he, he, gay does, he, just, he just gave about a 20-minute speech and never quoted, never quoted scripture whatsoever, but he did quote, uh, I believe I'm not mistaken, uh, Huck Finn and, and Tom yeah. Sawyer, yeah. Quite yeah. Yeah. who have nothing to do No authority. No authority. Truth. No authority. Exactly. So much and, and so basically what his speech was on feeling and, and what he thought instead right of what the truth was. And so that's why next Sunday, the 23rd, we're going to go and share the gospel at Brentwood Avenue Christian Church. Amen. He's the pastor. I let them know that this is what the scripture actually says. What I face as an ally is 